Even if Watchtower had a theory of cognizable harm, which it does not, Doe's identity would be irrelevant to what it is supposedly trying to determine, whether Doe's posting had any discernible effect on web traffic to JW.org. Doe does not have information about Watchtower's website. Watchtower does. The court's decision to order Doe's name disclosed so that Watchtower could pursue information already in its possession was erroneous and unjust. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So there is an update in the Watchtower subpoena to Reddit for Dark Spilver's identity. It's, I'm not going to classify it as good or bad. I think it could be good. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has made a motion for reconsideration, which is a weird thing where you tell a judge they are wrong and you ask them to correct it. Now, yours truly has done this once before successfully. So I get to toot my own horn for a moment. And this is a very strange thing because try to imagine, try to put yourself in the party's shoes. You've gone to court, you've argued your thing, sometimes for months or years. The judge is kind of tired of your argument because you've gone over it already. The judge has already issued a ruling. The judge has already made a decision. And you get to say, stop everything. We can't go on to the next step of the process because judge, you've made a mistake. Now, think of the last time you wanted to walk up to a police officer and tell them, hey, you're making a mistake. Or what's the last time you wanted to walk up to a, a, an angry person and tell them they're making a mistake? Or when's the last time you wanted to walk up to a huge bodybuilder who looked like he was just casually enjoying his day and tell them that they're wrong? No, you don't want to do that, let alone you don't want to tell a judge you're wrong. But if you're the attorney, or especially you know, if, you're, if you're the party, you, you have to represent your case. And if the, if the judge did something wrong, well, you have to tell them. Mine, I'll, I'll, I'll pull back the green curtain. Mine was real easy. My judge had simply misread something. My client was supposed to receive two times a number, and the judge had issued an order for one times the number. So we simply pointed that out, and the judge said, oh, yeah, we're, you're right. I'll reissue the opinion, or reissue, reissue the order. And the judge reissued the order, this time saying, like, yeah, that's supposed to be two times. So no big deal there. Here, here this is a little bit more complicated. So here is the Electronic Frontier Foundation's motion on behalf of John Doe for a de novo determination of dispositive matter referred to the magistrate judge. This is a short, this is a, this is a long way of saying a motion for reconsideration. So we're going to skip, I'm going to make you skip their table of contents so you can't see what they're about to argue. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has no cognizable copyright claim against Movent John Doe and therefore no need for discovery. This is an attempt by Watchtower to use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to uncover the true identity of an anonymous online commentator not to pursue a legitimate copyright case. The court found that the undisputed facts for each of the relevant factors show that Doe's use, including a picture of the background or the back page of Watchtower's magazine in a post commenting on its contents, was fair and authorized by law. On that basis, it should have quashed Watchtower's subpoena under the first prong of the Highfields Capital Management Test. Given the public interest in Doe's speech, Watchtower's subpoena requires applying the most exacting standards. Instead, the court let Watchtower satisfy Highfields with bare assertions of copyright ownership that defy the factual record. That was error. In considering the balance of harms, the court correctly concluded they tip sharply in favor of protecting Doe's identity, particularly in light of Watchtower's failure to demonstrate any actual or likely harm, but again the court erred in failing to quash the subpoena under Highfields on that basis. Instead, the court ordered disclosure to Watchtower's counsel. That, too, was error. This type of half measure is not consistent with high fields or standard practice in intellectual property cases, and it does not address the harm of disclosure to Doe or deterrent effects on others. It also ignores Watchtower's failure to establish any legitimate reason it needs to know Doe's name. If Watchtower wishes to enforce its copyright, it can file a complaint under Doe's pseudonym and serve it via counsel in the present action. Given Doe's engagement in this proceeding, Watchtower can no longer contend it would be unable to adjudicate the copyright issues in this case without knowing Doe's name. 
correctly applied, both high fields and the federal rules of civil procedure require granting Doe's motion in full and quashing Watchtower subpoena. For the reasons that follow, Doe objects to and requests reconsideration of the magistrate judge's ruling to the extent it orders disclosure of identifying information about Doe to counsel for Watchtower instead of quashing the subpoena in its entirety. Motions to quash Digital Millennium Copyright Act subpoenas obtained pursuant to 17 U.S.C. 512-H are treated like other dispositive motions for which magistrate judges issue reports and recommendations that district courts then review de novo, which means brand new. Doe's motion to quash the DMCA subpoena obtained by Watchtower is a dispositive motion for the same reasons as in Birch Communications a case they cited above, or I guess they're citing now. There, the subpoena arose from alleged copyright infringement that was not yet and may never become the subject of an action pending in court. Instead of obtaining a subpoena through discovery procedures in any pending case, the copyright holder obtained the subpoena pursuant to 17 U.S.C. 512H, like here. Because the sole purpose of a 512 subpoena is to obtain the identity of an alleged infringer, the question of whether or not to inform Force it was the only matter before the court, the resolution of which determines with finality the duties of the parties. The circumstances here are the same. Watchtower subpoena arose from allegations that may never lead to a lawsuit and was obtained via 512H solely to obtain Doe's identity, making the question whether to enforce it and compel Reddit to disclose Doe's identity the only matter before the court, and only that will determine the party's duties respecting the subpoena with finality. In this context, Doe's motion to quash is a dispositive motion reviewed de novo pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 636b1. Don't actually know what that is. Let's take a look at that. So this is jurisdiction powers and temporary assignments. B1 is notwithstanding any provision to the law of co to, uh, uh, notwithstanding any provision of the law to the contrary, a judge may designate a magistrate judge to hear, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so this is the law of magistrate judges. The court erred in concluding that Watchtower satisfied the first prong of Highfields. For the reasons that follow, Doe objects to and requests reconsideration to the extent that it that the order requires disclosure of identifying information to counsel for Watchtower instead of quashing the subpoena in its entirety. The court erred in disregarding fair use entirely in determining whether Watchtower had made a sufficient showing under the first step of the Highfields test. This is an action to enforce a DMCA subpoena. The Ninth Circuit has held that for the purposes of the DMCA, fair use is uniquely situated in copyright law so as to be treated differently than traditional affirmative defenses, citing Lentz v. Universal Music. Because 17 U.S.C. 107 created a type of non-infringing use, fair use is authorized by the law and therefore a copyright holder must consider the existence of fair use before sending a takedown notice under 512C. Regardless of whether fair use must be considered before sending a takedown notice, it must be considered here where the subpoena is based on the DMCA which requires copyright holders to consider fair use before they even initiate court action. The court cited no authority for disregarding fair use at the first step of Highfields, where, as here, the court's own fact findings weigh overwhelmingly in favor of fair use and against infringement. The Art of Living case does not support that approach. The court made clear its decision turns on the balance of harms at the second step of the analysis, not the adequacy of the copyright holders showing at the first. Because the court finds that plaintiff has failed to meet its burden under Highfields, this is in Art of Living, in the Highfield second prong, it is unnecessary to determine whether plaintiff's evidence is sufficient to establish a prima facie case of copyright infringement, otherwise a basic case of copyright infringement. Although the court in Art of Living relied on the balance of harms, it emphasized that fair use might require consideration at the first step of Highfields in other cases. Quote, as the fair use doctrine enshrines an important First Amendment protection a court determining whether to unmask an anonymous defendant might consider fair use arguments raised in a motion to quash even where the applicable standard requires only a prima facie showing of the plaintiff's claim. Moreover, Art of Living did not involve a subpoena issued pursuant to the DMCA, which independently requires copyright holders to consider fair use before invoking its provisions. 
they then go through the facts on the record that support a finding of fair use. The court's decision to ignore fair use led it to ignore the self-evident reason why Watchtower does not need Doe's name. It has no enforceable copyright claim to pursue in any U.S. court. As shown below, the court's own fair use analysis makes that clear. On the purpose and character of the use, quote, There is no factual dispute about the posting, however, because of the non-profit nature of Dark Spilver's posting and his stated purpose to evoke conversation, the court finds that this factor weighs in favor of Dark Spilver. On the nature of the copyrighted work, the work was published in November 2018, largely is informational and functional, directs readers how to make donations online, and therefore, this factor also weighs in favor of Dark Spilver. The amount and substantiality test, part three, the posting used only a small portion of the copyrighted work as a whole, the 32 page November 2018 Watchtower magazine. The advertisement was the last page. Again, there is no factual dispute, nor was the advertisement qualitatively the heart of the published magazine, which was rather full of articles discussing matters of faith for Jehovah's Witnesses. And I have conducted my own first-hand investigation, as I received a knock on my door on Friday morning, I think it was, yes, it was on Friday morning, and uh, might have been Thursday morning, and a very nice, sincere, earnest-looking gentleman handed me a copy of the Watchtower magazine while asking me what the first thing I want to know about people when I meet them is. I very gently took the magazine and perused through it, and I can confirm the magazine does contain articles and things in the middle of it. And yes, there was the JW.org advertisement on the back page, exactly the same as we saw here. And the magazine itself is only about a foot by a foot, maybe 10 by 10 or something. It's not very large. It's not like a big magazine, not that that terribly matters. And the quality of the pages was more like modern newsprint, maybe like waxed newsprint. It was very thin. It was in the, these were not thick pages. These were very light pages. And it was in full color. So it was full color on this sort of uh, light waxy paper. Like magazine paper, just think extremely thin, like newsprint. The newsprint version of magazine paper is what I'm thinking of. So that's what that was. I'm not saying anything more about it. I'm just, that's what, that's what it is. The effect on the potential market Watchtower has not demonstrated any actual harm or likelihood of future harm. So, based on these findings, all pointing in a favor of fair use, the court should have concluded its analysis at the first step of Highfields and quashed Watchtower subpoena on that basis. There is no reason to allow discovery on a claim that would be fruitless to pursue. The court applied far too low a standard to Watchtower's request to invade the right to anonymous speech on matters of public concern. Here, the solicitation practices of a powerful international organization. According to the Ninth Circuit, the nature of the speech should be a driving force in choosing a standard by which to balance the rights of anonymous speakers in discovery disputes. In choosing the proper standard to apply, the district court should focus on the nature of the speech conducted by the defendant rather than the cause of action alleged by the plaintiff. The court here found that Dark Spilver anonymously posted to the Reddit forum to comment on and foster thoughtful and critical dialogue on the practices of Jehovah's Witnesses and concluded that Dark Spilver's speech was a matter of public interest. On that basis, the court should have applied the highest possible standard to Watchtower's request instead it applied the lowest standard imaginable, relying on Watchtower's base assertion of ownership and Doe's assertion of fair use to find Highfield's first prong satisfied. Neither Highfield's nor Art of Living supports this low bar for copyright owners seeking to unmask anonymous online speakers. As the Ninth Circuit has noted, the lowest bar the courts have used is the motion to dismiss or good faith standard. At the very least, the court here should have applied the low bar of a motion to dismiss standard and required at least a plausible claim before violating the right to anonymous speech. Had the court applied the motion to dismiss standard, it would have granted Doe's motion to quash based on the undisputed facts establishing Doe's use was fair and therefore authorized as a matter of law. Applying the higher standard this court has deemed these Doe tests to resemble, namely the preliminary injunction inquiry, would produce the same result. Under any standard applicable to speech on matters of public concern, the undisputed facts of fair use are fatal to Watchtower's subpoena.
The court's decision to order disclosure despite finding that the harms tip sharply in Doe's favor and Watchtower's failure to demonstrate any actual or future harm was error. The court acknowledged that Doe demonstrated significant harms if his identity were revealed publicly or even if it were revealed to Jehovah's Witnesses in his congregation. By contrast, Watchtower demonstrated no actual or likely harm. Thus, in balancing the harms while considering the fair use defense, the court found that they tip sharply in Dark Spilver's favor. Again, the court's own findings require quashing Watchtower's subpoena according to the letter and spirit of Highfields. But instead of reaching a result that reflected the court's balancing of the harms, it ordered disclosure of Doe's identity to Watchtower's in-house counsel. Doing so defeats the purpose of Highfields. When the harms of unmasking a Doe outweigh those of denying a copyright holder's subpoena, it must be quashed. Holding otherwise eviscerates Highfield's protections for anonymous speech as a practical matter. Given Doe's demonstration of harm and Watchtower's failure to show anything that could alter the balance, the court erred in failing to grant Doe's motion in full and quash Watchtower's subpoena. Although the court found the balance of harms tipped in Doe's favor, it erred in failing to consider the chilling effect that forced disclosure of Doe's name will have on open discussion of Watchtower publications and practices by others. Courts must ask whether disclosure of the defendant's identity would deter other critics from exercising their First Amendment rights. Given the nature of Doe's speech, it was error for the court to ignore how its order would affect the speech of non-parties in the future. Although the court acknowledged the existence of other anonymous commenters, Watchtower publications within the XJW community on Reddit, it did not consider the the effect of its order on members of that community. As Doe's declaration explains, anonymity on Reddit uniquely facilitates open discussion of matters related to the Jehovah's Witnesses that is not possible elsewhere. The court should have considered the message disclosing Doe's identity in this case would send to others, including the chilling effect on fair use and other authorized uses of Watchtower's publications. Otherwise, the DMCA will become a tool for silencing and deterring protected speech instead of incentivizing creativity. The court erred in finding that Dark Spilver's concerns stem largely out of his fear that those in his congregation will discover his identity and shun him, and therefore, if Reddit reveals Dark Spilver's identity to Watchtower's counsel under an attorney's eyes only restriction, then any harm to Dark Spilver would be alleviated. That mischaracterizes Doe's concerns and ignores the well established practice of not disclosing highly confidential information to in house counsel. Doe set forth their reasons for speaking about these topics only on Reddit and only anonymously. Quote, in my experience, people who voice their disagreement or doubts ultimately face rejection and disapproval from other members of the Jehovah's Witness community, including leadership and ordinary members. Doe did not once reference their local congregation or suggest their fears were limited to disclosure to its members. To the contrary, Doe explained that Jehovah's Witness organization is based in the United States but has members around the world and that the organization's leadership and direction affects us all. Disclosure of highly confidential information to in-house counsel is not permissible in a standard intellectual property case. For example, this district's standard model protective order authorizes the disclosure of information that is highly confidential for attorney's eyes only to, quote, the receiving party's outside counsel of record, not in-house counsel. And it defines outside counsel to exclude attorneys who are employees of a party like Watchtower's counsel of record is here. Given the commercial nature and public interest in Doe's speech, Doe should receive at least the same protection that private companies routinely receive for commercial information without comparable constitutional protection. Under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, the court must limit discovery when the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit. Considering the needs of the case, the amount in controversy, the party's resources, the importance of the issues at stake in the action, and the importance of the discovery in resolving the issue. Issues. The court failed to consider whether the rules require rejecting Watchtower's request because it has no genuine need for the information sought that could possibly support the request. In particular, Watchtower does not need to know Doe's name either to pursue legal action or discover evidence relevant to market harm and thus fair use. It was error for the court to conclude otherwise and order disclosure on either ground. 
Copyright holders do not need to know a defendant's name to commence litigation, at least whereas here, the putative defendant is already participating in litigation against them. As this court has held, when a Doe engages in the litigation, albeit under a pseudonym, that diminishes the plaintiff's need to obtain the true name. Here, as in Art of Living, Doe's engagement in this proceeding diminishes Watchtower's need to know Doe's true name. It was error for the court to order disclosure without considering Doe's participation and its effect on Watchtower's proffered need. Copyright holders also do not need to know a defendant's name to determine if markets for their original works suffer harm. Nevertheless, the court permitted disclosure of Doe's name on the theory that Watchtower needed such information to demonstrate its far-fetched theory of market harm on the direction of traffic away from JW.org, their website. That was wrong for three reasons. First, the court acknowledged that Watchtower demonstrated no actual harm or likelihood of harm, but it credited what Watchtower's counsel argued generally at the hearing, namely, quote, that the harm it suffered from people infringing on its copyrights was directing others away from its website. It was error for the court to rely on this argument from Watchtower's counsel to contravene record evidence establishing that fair use and the balancing of harms require granting Doe's motion. Attorney argument is not evidence. Second, the number of visitors to Watchtower's website is irrelevant to market harm in this context. If Doe's commentary on Watchtower's publication drew visitors away from Watchtower's website, that is not copyright harm. When a lethal parody, like a scathing theater review, kills demand for the original, it does not produce a harm cognizable under the Copyright Act. The economic effect of a parody with which we are concerned is not its potential to destroy or diminish the market for the original. Any bad review can have that effect, but rather whether it fulfills the demand for the original. Biting criticism suppresses demand. Copyright infringement usurps it. Even if Doe's commentary somehow diminished demand, that could not establish market harm here. Third, even if Watchtower had a theory of cognizable harm, which it does not, Doe's identity would be irrelevant to what it is supposedly trying to determine, whether Doe's posting had any discernible effect on web traffic to JW.org. Doe does not have information about Watchtower's website. Watchtower does. The court's decision to order Doe's name disclosed so that Watchtower could pursue information already in its possession was erroneous and unjust. Highfields, properly applied, requires granting Doe's motion to quash Watchtower's subpoena. Given the undisputed facts establishing the public's interest in Doe's speech, the fairness of the use, and the overwhelming harm disclosure would have on Doe and others, Watchtower's subpoena must be quashed. For the foregoing reasons, Doe respectfully requests the court reconsider and grant Doe's motion to quash Watchtower's subpoena in full, submitted Alexandra H. Moss and Corinne McSherry from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I think that's remarkable. Um, instead of appealing to the Ninth Circuit or appealing further than that or whatever, they asked the judge to reconsider the magistrate judge's ruling. Because remember, it was magistrate judge Sally Kim, but there's a different judge who is the actual not magistrate judge who's going to issue the final orders in the case and all that. So they are asking the not magistrate judge to issue a order overriding the magistrate judge's recommendations. So what do we think of that? That's quite remarkable, and I'm happy that we have organizations like the EFF on our side. I really hope that the judge agrees with EFF. I think that they have some strong arguments, particularly that um, that the plaintiff doesn't need the identity in order to proceed, and that the you know a, a first glance analysis shows um, all of the um, all of the elements leaning towards fair use. Um, so I just it would really suck <laughs> from yeah. from someone who likes the First Amendment and from someone who likes fair use and from someone who likes um, the freedom to be able to comment on things anonymously online. Um, I I don't want those freedoms and rights chipped away and i don't think that's the purpose of copyright and to me this just screams that watchtower is using copyright in order to try to get an identity and i don't think it works like that and it's sad because i really do think it will have a chilling effect i think that it's already had a chilling effect i'm pretty sure that 
anyone who was about to criticize the Watchtower or Jehovah's Witness organizations, especially by making use of their copyrighted material, is now not going to do that, knowing that the organization will come after you in court. I think some of this is already a victory for Watchtower because all they needed to do was show that they're willing to go to court and get us all talking about it. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's scary, and I'm and I hope that the judge rules, and we will of course be tracking this case. It's uh, it's obviously really important to us too. And that is our show. Thank you very much to our supporters on Patreon.com/ljfrench and Sponsus.org/u/lawfulmasses. Thank you very much to our $50 plus supporters for the month of June. Thank you very much to John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Michael Pierce, Terry Chris, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Aspernari, and Snorri Wazotsky. Andy says he'll be back. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we can support Andy in some way. So if Andy needs our support. <laughs> And then the $5 plus supporters are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. This month I made the sponsors supporters first. Next month I'll switch it back or we'll figure out some script so that I can go back to doing it based on donation and time. Um, but for now you're first because I, I don't want to neglect you. So thank you all very much for joining me today. I will have a very special video for you. We did dog pool party this week, but... Um, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to incorporate it into the outro, so we'll have that playing here then. Until next time, I will see you in the videos that drop. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you to Tactical and Brandon and Kaylee who are here with me today, and have a great week. Love you all. Bye.